Normally, I would be doing a video on the notch back because that's what I'm working on, but I don't. I never got a transmission from the guy that I paid for a transmission. So instead, I'm going to be working on the RX-7 in this week's episode of Logan is trying to lose weight and he's fat and he's overweight and let's work on a car this week. I got to come up with a shorter name for the series. But I got Michael, I'm at Dynasty, and we're going to work on the FD. Michael's cutting my radiator. Everything's making so much noise! Come on! Michael is cutting my radiator up because my last rear mount radiator setup, the core of the radiator started leaking, probably from me taking it in and out and ruining it. So that, along with a couple revisions to the radiator, the cooling system, I wanna knock out now so the rest of the season I don't have any issues which includes adding a surge tank to the system. And I'm gonna go over all this stuff with you. So welcome to Dynasty, first of all. I, I haven't filmed a lot in here. Uh, this is my day job. We got everything from McLarens getting upgraded. We got a Hellcat getting stuff done. We got like a 10,000 original mile Talon TSI. We got a 370Z that the front end just came off of it in a little bit of a situation, putting that thing back together. And we got a big old Jeep. This Jeep is actually so sick. Michael, prior to working with us at Dynasty, helped assemble this thing, and it is dirty. We also just added a complete Haltech engine management system to it. So that the new uh, IC7 screens in there, and a set of trick flow heads. It's LS, obviously, six liter powered. This thing's sick. So that's the, the quick and, and brief overview on Dynasty and there's way more that goes into the shop than just the few projects I showed you. Today, I'm working on my RX-7. Also, you know, don't forget, do not forget that the Mopar situation is in fact on lock here at Dynasty. I mean, it's not a Hellcat though. So, I mean, like what could it have? It's not a Hellcat. Oh, that's what it have. All the ponies in the pony neighborhood are found directly under the hood of this here scat pack. Suck it also got an evo 10 we do a lot of a, a lot of stuff there's a lot going on all right back to the rx7 i'll explain uh, again i've done like 37 rear mount radiator videos this is going to be another one of those 417 uh, motorsports water block so it takes up the fittings for where you or where your water pump normally mounts this is outlet back to the rear and then the inlet right here from the pump goes right there and i'll show you the under skirt view in just a minute I found out recently that Michael's shy and doesn't want to be on camera. So what do you do? You get up in his grill until he enjoys it. Why don't you love me? So quite a bit of work needs to go into this radiator. It's just a Griffin radiator, their core. We're going to have to lop these off, weld some 16 AN. I say it like I'm going to be doing it. Michael's going to be doing it. I'm not pin. <laughs> oh God. Okay, I think, I think we got the pen fixed. But the old inlet for the radiator gets lopped off. We'll brick that in. Some 16 ANs on this turd burglar. And then we'll be able to mount it up underneath the vehicle. Now, the previous iteration of this rear mount kit did not have an inline surge tank. So I literally just ran a pump into the radiator, out of the radiator, up to the front of the car, and then recycled back into um, the inlet of the pump. So that setup. It, no matter what I did, it still just retained too much heat in the system. I got with Blake Hughes at 417, and he gave me the lowdown on how to do it more efficiently, which is why we're redoing it all right now, because I don't want to mess with this ever again. Now, while Michael's doing the heavy lifting on the welding and the actual fabrication, um, I'm going to show you guys real quick how I plan to wire my radiator fan in, and then uh, we'll go from there. But when he's done mounting and running all the lines, that's when I'll be able to do an overview on how the system works, and how to uh, run your lines for optimal performance, which is the goal. Now, some things that I learned when doing this is number one, you have to have a shroud. There's no way to have an effective cooling system all the way through without a shroud. The reason you want a shroud, this will butt up against the core, obviously the radiator, and it'll force all the air over the entire core instead of just bolting a fan to the core and only cooling that circle. So you can see how it's stepped. It'll sit just above the core and in doing that, it'll create suction from the bottom side to pull air over the whole core of the radiator. 
Now they sell this as a kit. My radiator as it by itself was like 250 bucks. Griffin radiator and Griffin fan shroud. I think they sell it as a kit for five or 600 bucks. The fan that I had with it brief before just was not strong enough. So I opted for a spal fan. The other thing I know I've learned is straight blade versus a S blade. Uh, straight blades way louder and S blade is way quieter. They say they flow about the same from a CFM standpoint. I don't buy that. I've never seen the data, but this thing will lift the, well, I guess suck the back of the car to the ground. Um, fans work best as a puller rather than a pusher is the other thing I learned. So this will be mounted on the bottom side. So you'll see it underneath the car, but it's a puller style fan, a, uh, a 14 inch fan with a shroud and it'll go up and suck all the air over the whole core. In order to wire the fan in, um, I started packaging these and selling them through Dynasty's website. We're out of stock at the minute. This is the last one we had. It's just a standard two prong, two pin plug. It's heavier gauge, it's bigger gauge stuff. So 14 to 16 gauge wires for these two prongs. You can use these on fuel pumps, obviously not in fuel, but outside if you're plugging into a bulkhead, you can use these. Or in my case, a radiator fan, I'll throw it on the end there. And then I'll extend the wires on the chassis side to mate to the other side of this connector. So with this kit, you're going to get the female end of the plug. You're going to get the rubber grommet that goes in the back to seal it off. You'll get this clip that retains the pins. These pins are for the female plug. The male plug, all you need is the two pins for that. It already has the seal in the back. Uh, these are pulled to seat, so you'll push your wire through and pull the clips back. And these, I believe, are pushed to seat, so it'll be the opposite for these. But everything you need to make your own nice weatherproof connector for your fan or your pump or whatever you're using it for. One is going to... Step one is going to be taking that rubber grommet I showed you, slide it over the wires. I strip them after I slide it over so it's easier. And then strip these out just a little bit. And on the pins themselves, you see there's two. Let me set this down. This section right here, let me point, I'll point, I'll get a pointer. This section right here, this crimp, or that, that part of the pin rather, will be crimping bare wire. And this part back here will be crimping the insulated part of the wire. So I'm sure I'll have people make fun of the way I've done this, but you see what I'm talking about there where it crimps the wire and then behind it crimps the insulation. Again, I'm not a professional wire, but the old tug test, that sucker is not coming off. Both of them crimped. I'll slide them through the back of the connector and you're gonna hear a little click. And that click you hear are those little pins that are popping up on the actual crimp or on the pin itself, that little uh, metal, whatever you wanna call it, that's sticking up. That's actually clipping into the connector itself. So I, all I've done is loosely stuck them through the back there, as you can see. They're not protruding yet, but you'll, you'll hear, I can't do this one-handed, you hear that snap? That's them snapping into place, and now they're locked in place on the front side. Pull this back, hear that other click. They just clip straight in. There you go. Then you're gonna take, pull it. This will go through the back side and lock them into place. And once that's inside, locked it into place, that rubber piece will follow to seal the connector. Just like that, you're done. You got the female side done. And then obviously the male side corresponds. The difference between this connector and that connector is those pins were pushed to seat. So you crimp them beforehand. This, I'll actually pull the wire through the back side of the connector, then crimp and pull it down and you'll hear it click and snap into place. So the pins are the exact same as the other ones in terms of crimping. However, I push them through and I crimp them before I pull them back and then because they're pulled to seat. So you'll hear those clips. That means that's seated and the connector is done. Make sure before you crimp these that you know that the orientation is right. Red matches red, black matches black. Oh, there. That's all there is to it. So now I have a nice heavy duty plug that I can use and a line and lead of wire so I can connect this to the existing, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but there's some wires dangling, those green wires connect it to that and it'll run all the way up the car to my relay box behind the dash. While I've been while I've been playing technician over there, Michael is doing work on the radiator. He's getting that stuff welded in and then we have a surge tank that's going to get mounted. So this hose right here that you see, this hose, if you were to follow it, goes down and underneath the car, along the car and it comes so right here, this is the outlet of the cooling system. 
LS engines coolant flows in the bottom ports, up through the heads, and then out the top ports. So this is the outlet. So that'll go all the way down to the back of the car and terminate where I showed you. I use an inline fill cap right here so I can fill it up front and then the overflow goes to my overflow tank right there. This guy's still in works. He's, we're putting this together, I say we. Michael's welding this up right now. Um, actually, it looks killer. I haven't even looked at it yet, but this is gonna get mounted right yonder. So somewhere like this, um, when we get it finished mounted, I set this down. That hose will go into the top port of the surge tank. The bottom of the surge tank will have a 16A in fitting, and the bottom port of the surge tank will go straight through my floorboard and fill the radiator. The top of this will have a radiator cap that will vent to an overflow tank as well. And Michael is welding up where my old radiator cap was, just bricking and plating that in. And then we will take, get it over here. Let's see. We will take this and this will be the new top of that surge tank that I just showed you. So recycling parts, sick. Oakley dokley. So the surge tank's coming together. There's a little mounting tab that we've, I, again, I say weave like I've been welding. He's got going on there. We'll nut cert the wheel well, and then you can see the feed and then the drain at the bottom will go into the radiator, radiator cap up top. I actually elected to plug that cap without the overflow because I have an overflow vent up front. So I will not run one in the back. Back over yonder, just stare straight into the beam. Straight into the beam right there look right there all right so i've nutserted behind here and i got two m6 bolts holding it now i have to take this straight down i gotta open up the area below the tank so this can feed straight down to the radiator here's a shot of that surge tank with it outside of the car so 16 an in and out and then a radiator top and then this will just mount right on the side like I had it and you're good to go right now he's welding up the fittings on the radiator which looks a lot better than what I could do being the first of mount of the mounts on the radiator itself so we have somewhere to anchor to underneath the car so oh, I can turn these wipers off they're crazy loud okay there we go so it's the next morning uh, the reason uh, I'm, I'm segueing with this right now is actually a very purposeful reason. That's purposeful is a word, isn't it? Someone fact check me on that real quick. So the reason that I, uh, I'm doing this little segue is to highlight the fact that uh, stuff takes time, right? If you took your car to a shop and, and again, every fabricator is different. Everyone will take a different amount of time to do something. You can chuck something like this together in a couple hours and call it a day, or you can take your time and do it right and make sure it's nice. The reason I bring that up is from 9 a.m. yesterday to 6.30 p.m., we did nothing but rear mount radiator. That's all we did all day. It's condensed to like 15, 20 minutes with whatever this video is. And it, it seems like, oh man, that's easy to knock it out. So if you pay a shop to do this type of work for you and you go get a bill and they tell you, yeah, it took 10 hours, in your head, don't think, 10 hours? What all you did was mount a radiator in the back. Okay, no, there's so much more that goes into fabrication than just chuck it in there, it'll work. Um, so either way, I'm on my way back to the shop right now. Michael was able to finish mount the radiator last night. I'm gonna show you that when I get in and I'll show you what I have left to do, which is, min it's not a lot, it's a minuscule amount of work, but um, there's still some stuff left to do, point being, pay your shops what they're worth if you want it done right and you want it done well you got to pay um, or learn to do it yourself that's the other idea if you if you can fabricate or you want to dive into it and and learn metal work and learn fabrication i am all about people learning how to do it on their own i am not gifted in the fabrication department um, and i know that about myself so i pay people to do it for me <laughs> Okay, now that I'm done preaching, I'll uh, walk you through this again. So we have the uh, outlet. You feed the bottom ports, top ports come out. The 417 manifold has four ports, two lower, two upper. So we block one upper, 
so we can exit up there. We block one lower so we can feed the low side. And then this, I have an inline fill, like I said, up front with pressure release to go to my catch can. That low side will go all the way to my surge tank. And then my surge tank literally drains straight into the radiator with the pump in line in the radiator. So cut this on real quick. Still have hair to bleed out, but there you have it. And that will, again, drain in the radiator, feed the pump. The pump will push back forward to the front of the car. Um, you can see that line will go all the way down and around to the for front of the car into the bottom port. The orientation of the pump, the outlet of the pump, the pump has to be sideways, and the outlet of the pump should be facing up. So that's how I have my pump mounted. Um, I do have to air bleed this line when I do mine because the only place to mount this pump, unfortunately, is above the level of the radiator just a little bit. So it's kind of a pain to bleed, um, regardless of having a surge tank, but that's there's no real estate in this car for the way I have it set up. If I could do it over again, I would have cut out this whole trunk pan, plated it, and then moved the radiator farther down. I'm sorry, yeah, the radiator down. I'm, let me start over. Radiator up, pump farther down, so the pump would be the absolute lowest point of the system, but I have to work with what I have now to get this thing ready for race season. So, all is working well. I'm stoked on the way it turned out. Let's see, one more time. Oh yeah, there she goes. For simplicity's sake, let me clear this off. This is, uh, this is what we got. This is how we're routing mine. Radiator sucks in. We fill from the top where that expansion tank is. So the radiator will bleed down to the pump. The pump has to be oriented like this. You can't put it on its side. Down to the lower port of the engine, out the top, expansion tank, drain into radiator, so on and so forth. Go ahead and screenshot that if you need to. And I'll get underneath here and show you the mounts he made, so gusseted, don't mind the paint that I've destroyed, but gusseted over there, and then the front side goes to my subframe. Same deal, we braced it on both sides. Well, we, he, Michael, braced it on both sides. So, I'm letting the car idle up right now, and I won't kick my water pump on until about 145, 150 degrees, and I want you to see how fast the temperature drops when I kick the pump on, and then subsequently when the fan kicks on, how it handles that. All right, so I'm gonna turn my water pump on. Look at the water temp. All right, now we got some temp in it, 189. Everything is operational now. I will say, after I let it get up to full temp, these systems can take a little while to bleed. Even my, my system isn't ideal because of the height of the pump. I wish the pump I could mount it below the radiator, but I don't have room in the back how my stuff's set up now. So get it up to full temp. I plug my overfill. I let it sit till it gets down, probably 140, 150. When I pop that, a ton of air comes up and out, and then I'll cycle the pump on. I'll cycle it on and off times just to make sure it's all the way bled out you can still see a little bit of air coming up through there and the goal is to get all the air out of the system all right this is the last clip of the video there's water temp i'm idling in a well ventilated space to go ahead and cut my pump off i got no water
baby. Come on, better start dropping. <laughs>